quarterback troubles, make or break games, and two teams that could have been 4-0 as we enter and overreact to week four of the SEC football season. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Lucas Hill here of SEC Unfiltered. Make sure you hit that like button and also share and subscribe. Turn on the bell notification so that you are notified for every time we post a new video here on SEC Unfiltered. Make sure you check out secunfiltered.com for the podcast version of the episode, as well as more articles and other interesting stuff from the best staff from the best SEC entity on the internet. As usual, every overreaction money is brought to you by our good friends over at Prize Picks. Go on over to prizepicks.com or download the Prize Picks app on your Apple or Android device and use the code SECU at initial sign up to get $50 instantly in free bets. When you place your first $5 or more lineup throughout the month of September, they're having a brand new special for that. Every time Caleb Williams throws for a just one yard, you win big. So go ahead and take advantage of those deals and many more with code S-E-C-U. Let's just go ahead and kick this thing off. We're not going to waste any more time. Let's go ahead and get into overreaction Monday. Mississippi State, there's no doubt about it. They're the worst team in the SEC. Not only did you just lose your starting quarterback for the rest of the year, you don't even know if you're going to be able to get him back for next year. Look, for for starters, Jeff Lebby goes back. This all goes back to Jeff Lebby's hires at the beginning of the year. You hire Coleman Hutzler to run the defense, but guess what? It's been a huge struggle. Yes, he's worked with guys like Nick Saban and Will Muschamp and many more, but you haven't had any success whatsoever on the defensive side of the football. You're one of the worst in the run game. You're 111th in total defense, and there's no guarantee that you're going to improve. And it maybe it does have to do with play calling. Maybe it also has to do with the fact that this is a very young defense as well. But you're telling – I mean, this loss this past week just proved to the entire world that Mississippi State is going to be the worst team in the SEC in all likelihood. Don't be surprised if they go 0-8 and in SEC play. It hasn't happened in a while, but man. Jeff Levy's offense is going to be elite, and we knew that Mississippi State's defense – was going to have problems. Now it's just going to get worse from this year now that you just lost your starting quarterback and the play calling on defense is absolutely horrendous. For the Florida Gators, they may work with two quarterbacks for the rest of the year. I wouldn't doubt one bit about it. Look, Florida has had their struggles all season long with inefficient quarterback play, from Graham Mertz and, of course, DJ Lagway, who has shown promise. But again, he's still young. He, We still don't know what he's going to be like if he is to remain in this system at Florida. Had plenty of success. Both of them combined for just under 300 yards total passing. Showed success with running the football as well. You got DJ Lagway involved in the run game. I don't think Graham Mertz really ran as much as you would have thought. But look, had a big time game against a poor Mississippi State defense. And they just ran flat over them. The running game finally got on. Montrell Johnson had a big game. Jaden Ball had some big carries. So look, for if you're Florida... You needed to win this upcoming game against Mississippi State in order to keep Billy Napier's job alive for the next two weeks going into the bye so that you don't have to fire him before the game against UCF. But, hey, things are going to change once October 5th comes around. If they lose that game, Billy Napier will be fired on Monday. He's not going to have a presser. Come come Sunday morning, reports are going to come out that they have officially fired Napier and – All likelihood, Dan Enos will take over as the interim head coach for the rest of the year. It's been a hectic season for Florida. It's been a hectic offseason, and it's not going to get any better if they do lose in two weeks against UCF. 
for the Auburn Tigers, they don't have a quarterback. Boy, is this going to be fun. Boy, is this going to be really bad. And guess what? There's nobody else to blame but Hugh Freeze himself. Hugh Freeze has literally blown this opportunity. I said it one of my first videos that I ever did here with SCC Unfiltered. I thought that Auburn needed to go out and get a transfer portal quarterback, yet they refused to do so. This is nobody else's fault but Hugh Freeze's. <clears throat> Look, as good as Hugh Freeze is and as his offensive philosophy is, he is too loyal to quarterbacks. You have to be able to go recruit a quarterback. You can't go into the high school anymore. Nobody does it. Nobody wants to wait two or three years to have a quarterback develop. The only ones that are willing to do that is if they have an experienced veteran in front of them, and you know that that's going to be your guy to the, of the future, just like South Carolina has with Lenore Sellers and like Florida has at the moment with DJ Lagway and what Texas A&M is doing right now with Marcel Reed at the helm. Look. There's no doubt in my mind, Auburn can be one of the most talented teams in the SEC. They have a stacked receiving room. A stacked receiving room. Keandre Lambert set myth went over 100 yards receiving this past weekend. But look, if you don't have a decent quarterback, you're going to have trouble. It's every offense that really needs a quarterback you have to get one that's experienced. If I'm Hugh Freeze going into this offseason, from how this season is going, I'd expect that seat to heat up quite a bit going into 2025. And if you don't go into the portal next year and go get a quarterback, people in the Plains are not going to have fun with you next year. You may not last the entire season next year if you don't if you continue the same mantra that is going on with your loyalty of some sorts. Peyton Thorne isn't the guy. Hank Brown isn't the guy. There's nothing else that you can say other than you have to get experience from the portal. Going on to Texas A&M, there's an upset alert blooming when they play in Arlington this weekend against Arkansas. Look, Texas A&M has looked really bad on their offensive line, especially last week against Bowling Green. That... Look, Bowling Green came out and punched them square in the mouth. Punched them square in the mouth. And they had little to no response at times. Thank the Lord they finally got it together in the second half because if they lose that game, boy, does it make a huge blemish for Texas A&M going into Arkansas. Now you've just shown that you do look vulnerable. You've looked wildly inconsistent on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, you're blowing teams out for the first three games of the year, and then this past weekend, you got exposed. Your offensive line had their struggles. And Arkansas, and look, they're going up against a front four in Arkansas that is going to get after Marcel Reed on a consistent basis in the Southwest Classic. If Arkansas ends up winning this game, I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever. Look. This game is going to mean something for once. And it's going to be really critical for both of these teams down the stretch of the year. So if Texas A&M does get upset by Arkansas this upcoming weekend, I wouldn't be surprised one bit. I do think Taylor Green will have success against a guy like Marcel Reed. I think that matchup will be really fun. Going to be interesting between A&M's front four going up against a mobile quarterback like Taylor Green. For South Carolina, just enjoy Robbie Ashford for now. Because in two weeks, Lenore Sellers should be back healthy. I talked with Cole Bryson earlier, the fan upstate, about this situation, and he basically said the same thing. There's no knock on Robbie Ashford for how he performed this past weekend, but again, it's against Akron. It's nothing impressive. Because, look, South Carolina's offensive struggles are going to continue if they can't produce against Ole Miss in two weeks. And look, the next two games for them, Ole Miss and Alabama, you know that they don't really have a prayer of even winning that game. Unless some form of magic happens and Lenora Sellers has the best two games of his life, 
I don't think that South Carolina – I think South Carolina goes into the Oklahoma game at 3-3. Three and three. And look, from October 19th on through the rest of the season, you have to win at least three games in order just to make a bowl game. And look, let me tell you about the three that they could win. Vanderbilt's a toss-up going up to First Bank Stadium. You should win that game, although I will say – it just depends on how this offense can do against a fairly okay Vanderbilt defense. But although Vandy's defense did give up almost 200 yards individually by Nate Noel. So I think if South Carolina can establish the run game, I think they'll win that game. Missouri's been a toss up. They've struggled so far the last two weeks of the season. They have their question marks. Wofford should win, be a winnable game, and then Clemson going to Memorial Stadium. And if you remember two weeks ago, huge win for Shane Beamer and company. I think the seat does cool down quite a bit if South Carolina is able to make a bowl game and win a bowl game. If you're Shane Beamer and if you're on the hot seat right now, I think it cools down a good bit and it gives you an excuse to say, we had a young roster. We didn't do very well on the offensive side of the ball. You got to make changes on the offense. And maybe going into 2025, it will be a much improved year. And maybe that with how this defense performed last year, you're going to see the same success going into next year. For Ole Miss, Trey Harris has an opportunity to break A.J. Brown's school record. That is definitely not an overreaction. Trey Harris has been on a tear throughout the first four weeks of the season. Let me just read you the stats, and this is through four weeks. Now, I know they have not played anybody so far, but the numbers are still impressive. 38 receptions, 628, four touchdowns. That's hard to do in the first four games of the season. It's hard to put up 225 yards receiving. It's hard to do that, even in the game. It's hard to do that in college football 25. And the fact that he's putting that up in actual gameplay during an actual game, that's impressive to me. His performance is tied for fifth for the most receiving yards in a game. And I think the most receiving yards in a single season by A.J. Brown was 1320. Harris is about almost halfway there. He's got another 30 or so yards before he's officially halfway there. Look, Harris is going to continue this same trend. I think the next couple games that they do play, I think he has success against Kentucky this upcoming weekend. It's going to be interesting to see Maxwell Harrison against him. Trey Harris, though. I do think that he kind of does get limited. 50 to 70 yards is what you'll expect from Harris. But that's just another day at the office for him. He's going to have a lot of success through the throughout his receiving game. I think South Carolina, he goes for 100 yards. LSU, the same thing. By the time we get to the month of November, he should have over 1,000 yards receiving. Make no mistake about it. If he doesn't break that record, I'll be shocked. Just from how he's performed throughout the start of the year. But I'll be keeping a close eye on Trey Harris as they get prepared to start SEC play this upcoming weekend. For the Arkansas Razorbacks, we already talked about Texas A&M being on upset alert. A win for them is going to save Sam Pittman's job for now. And it gets them much closer to a bowl game because I think Arkansas would be looking at 4-1 and one going into that game. And I do think that Arkansas will have a good bit of momentum when they go play Tennessee back at home when you go play LSU at home. Next three games that you play, Texas A&M in a neutral site, going to Arlington this weekend, and then LSU and Mississippi State the next two weeks at home. LSU, you could say you have a legitimate opportunity at an upset just from how LSU's defense has still looked quite suspect. And with the loss of Harold Perkins, we'll see how they performed against Taylor Green and company. I do think that there's an upset brewing when, if they look, if they can beat LSU. So if they can start off the year, if they can upset Texas A&M this weekend, yeah, I do expect them to lose to Tennessee. But I'll tell you what, 
They could be enter, entering the Ole Miss game at 6-2, and two, and Sam Pittman's job will be saved. Well exceeds expectations for what Arkansas was supposed to do going into this year. There was no way in my mind that I thought Arkansas was going to be able to escape and get to 3-2 and two after the month of September. Now you have a legitimate opportunity to make a bowl game now that you have a couple of toss-up games on your schedule. Going to Missouri, Louisiana Tech at Ol- Mississippi State. If you can beat Texas A&M, you'll be going to a bowl game by the end of the year because I do think Mississippi State is winnable, and I think Louisiana Tech's a gimme too. So I think Arkansas's offense is going to do enough to steal a game or two. Hell, this could be an Arkansas team that we could be looking at as an eight-win regular season. Holy cow. That could be exceeding heck of a lot of expectations, and it will bring Sam Pittman in contention for SEC Coach of the Year, at least a top five finish as well. For Kentucky, you got two All-Americans on defense. Jamon Dumas Johnson and Maxwell Harrison are playing at an All-American type level. You rarely see that on a Kentucky defense. Usually when you think about Kentucky, you start to think about how they do on the offensive side of the ball and how they've been underwhelming. And they have been very much so this year. Is it on Bush Hamden? Is it on the play calling? Is it how Brock Vandekrift can't throw the football? We don't know yet. We'll find out whenever we get to this weekend when they play Ole Miss. But look, Kentucky's defense is going to have a fun little day against Ole Miss. It's going to be a fun little matchup to see the run game between Henry Parrish and Jamon Dumas Johnson, as well as Maxwell Harrison against this elite Ole Miss receiving core. We'll see how they fare. The, uh, the front five for Arkans- for Ole Miss has performed well, being able to protect Jackson Dart. Hasn't been scrambling a whole lot throughout the season. Deion Walker is going to have to play a heck of a game. Haven't really called his name out a whole lot throughout the season. But look, Deion Walker is a very dominant interior lineman, and he has an opportunity to showcase his skills this upcoming weekend against a very good front of Ole Miss. For LSU, the Harold Perkins injury hurts the defense. That's not an over. That's an overreaction. What people think about Harold Perkins' injury, and this is somebody that has watched him over the last two years. Harold Perkins' injury is not going to hurt this LSU defense, and let me tell you why. The way that he has been utilized for the last year or two, it's been disgraceful. He's an edge rut. He's been primarily dropping back into coverage, covering the flats, trying to make open field tackles. And he's done fairly good throughout the year. He made a T up. He got a couple of stops throughout the year. But he really hasn't showcased what he did during his freshman year, which was rushing the passer off the edge. That's something that you got to get back to putting him in. Look, Harold Perkins' injury is not going to hurt this defense. Let me tell you why. This front four has been unbelievable, especially the two edge rushers. Savion Jones and Braden Swinson will be all SEC candidates by the end of the year. Savion Jones has show, showcased his ability to rush. He exceeded my expectations. I thought that, you know, a guy that – really struggled last year, struggled to get anything going. And then all of a sudden, Jones has performed really well in big situations. So I wouldn't really be worried if I am this team. I thought that Savion Jones was going to be replaced at some point. I really did. I didn't think that he was going to stay around for a while. I thought that he was going to be replaced at some point. I thought that that a guy like Deshaun Womack could start over him. I thought Womack had an opportunity to start over Jones. But look, Savion's had a great start to the year. Braden Swinson's been on a tear recently. Got five sacks in the last two games. And he's just going to continue to elevate his game as the season goes on. So I wouldn't really be worried about LSU's defense without Harold Perkins. The biggest weakness so far has been the secondary, and it really needs to be addressed 
sooner rather than later down the road. For Missouri, do they have a dual threat quarterback weakness? If you are Missouri's defense, you are kind of worried at this point. They're good, but they're not as good as people thought they would be at the start of the year. They fell to number 11 this upcoming year, and guess what? They get the week off, but then they go play Marcel Reed and Texas A&M in two weeks. You have to take practice this week, and you have to address the weaknesses that you have shown so far on the defensive line in not being able to shut down the run game. You have struggled mightily against dual threat quarterbacks. Thomas Castellanos had his moments during the game a couple weeks ago and made sure that this was a tight ball game going into the fourth quarter. And Diego Pavia had a heck of a game against this Missouri defense. But look, I get that Missouri lost a lot of talent through injury, through the draft, and through the portal as well. But this was a Missouri defense that people still had high hopes for, that despite them losing Blake Baker, they thought that they would fit in right well with their new defensive coordinator. And so far, the last two weeks of the season, they've been exposed big time. They have to prepare this week in order to shut down a guy like Marcel Reed, maintain quarterback depth, don't let him get outside the pocket, and don't let him run. For Alabama, this could be Jalen Milrow's Heisman game. It's the biggest game that Alabama has played in the last 15 years. Forget all the national championships and such. This is the number one game that Alabama is going to be playing. And why? Because you have a brand new head coach. People are going to say that having to keep – there's pressure on both head coaches at this point, and we'll get to – Kirby Smart in a little bit. But let's talk about Kalen DeBoer. Having to fill in the footsteps of a guy like Nick Saban is rather difficult. But look, this is not Kalen DeBoer's first rodeo. He has had to replace some stars when it came to coaches. He had to replace Jeff Tedford a couple years ago at Fresno State. He had to replace the national championship winning coach whenever he was at the Division II level. He has to replace a guy that was really toxic at Washington and the locker room was an unbelievable mess out in Washington. And he turned that around and turned them into a national championship level contender for two years with a guy like Michael Penix. So don't expect this year to be any different. This is nothing new for Kalen DeBoer. I know that you're playing another juggernaut in Georgia. Look, if Jalen Milrow has the game of his life, if he performs better than he did last year against Georgia, you're going to have an opportunity for him to get his name known and continue to elevate his name in the Heisman rankings. And by November, if he keeps up with what he did last week against Wisconsin and the throws that he made and his ability to scramble, he'll be in New York by December. For Vanderbilt, should they be 4-0? Absolutely. Absolutely. You had a missed opportunity last week against Missouri that I really thought you could have won. You should have won that game. You should have won the week before against Georgia State, but you could not capitalize on missed opportunities that your opponent gave you. You should be looking at going into a game – like Alabama, 4-0. You get the week off, and then you go play Bama. Look, Vanderbilt's probably going to get killed, but this is a much different Vanderbilt team than what people are used to seeing. They're used to seeing the terrible Vandy that is on a regular 2-10, 3-9 regular season. That could change this year. Vanderbilt could very likely finish 4-8 or 5-7, and and it could be considered a success with how the season went. Vanderbilt has to win at least three SEC games in order to even come close to a bowl game or even be in conversation for a bowl game. If they do, there's no doubt in my mind that Vanderbilt can do it. Vanderbilt should be 4-0, but they've had letdown after letdown 
that has prevented them. They've got to finish the job down the stretch. They've got to play a complete game, and you've got to let your defense perform at a high level. For Tennessee, this is the most complete team in the Josh Hypo era. Yes, absolutely. This is not an overreaction. Used In the last two years, Tennessee's offense has always been the talk of college football. With Hendon Hooker and the potential Heisman season that he had throughout the month, throughout the first two or three months of the regular season in 2022, following their big win against Alabama. Look, the same could be said for Nico Iamayalaba. Now, despite how the offense performed last week against a tough Oklahoma defense, Tennessee's defense got after Jackson Arnold and Michael Hawkins. They absolutely had their way with them all day long. You consistently got pressure. You forced them out of the pocket. You forced the errant throws. And you ended up getting Jackson Arnold benched because of how he performed against this Tennessee defense. And yes, Hawkins had a late touchdown throughout the fourth quarter in the last five minutes, I think. But this was a blowout from start to finish. Tennessee's defense owned the line of scrimmage. They shut down the elite receivers that Oklahoma had. And yes, Oklahoma was injured majority of their receiving core. But that makes no excuse. Tennessee just proved that they could be the most complete team in the Josh Heupel era, and rightfully so. That's going to be the big difference between them being in the college football playoff and them just being a one-dimensional team. For Oklahoma, the Michael Hawkins Jr. era begins officially. Look, Mike Hawkins who comes out of, I believe he came out of somewhere in Florida, something like that. But regardless, Mike Hawkins was a really, really efficient quarterback at times. Oh, I'm sorry, he came from Dallas. That's my fault. Um, number three dual threat quarterback prospect, according to Rivals. He was, just, he was a top 35 quarterback, according to 247 Sports. But look. His dad played cornerback under Bob Stoops. Mike's a dang good quarterback. He has the opportunity to be efficient in the Seth Luttrell offense that revolves around the run game. It's called They call it the run and shoot, I want to say. But, hey, look, Mike Hawkins will fit an air raid type of system that Seth Luttrell has. And many people will think, well, Hawkins doesn't really have that great of an arm. Nah. He made some really good throws down the stretch of the game, especially in the fourth quarter, trying to rally the team from behind. And you saw his ability to scramble. You saw what he could do with his legs, and you saw why he could fit really well in the Seth Luttrell offense down the stretch of the year. Does Jackson Arnold still play? I do think so. It just depends on how Hawkins performs this upcoming week. And obviously, Brent Venables already said that there's going to be a quarterback competition in the week, but I think it's obvious after how he did against a good defense like Tennessee, Mike Hawkins is going to be officially your starting quarterback for the rest of the year. For Texas, you finally got the run game established. Congratulations. Now you're a complete offense. Jaden Blue finally ran for 120 plus yards. The run game, at, I think in total, the run game had almost 250 yards total rushing. But hey, Texas finally has the complete package. They have one of the best air systems. They have two of the best quarterbacks that, if either or gets hurt, I wouldn't be shot. I would not be worried one bit about Texas because not only do they have a solid run game, they also have an efficient quarterback. You know, either Arch Manning or Quinn Ewers. So I wouldn't really be worried about Texas down the stretch. Got a big one coming up, though, and we'll see how it performs as they enter SEC play this upcoming week. For Georgia, final one. This could be Kirby Smart's biggest game of his career. Let me tell you why. The torch has been passed from one goat to another. Kirby Smart may be carrying the tradition of goat status coming from Nick Saban. 
it's going to be difficult to have to replace a guy like that and carry on the legacy of another SEC program. Kirby Smart may be under a lot of pressure because if you lose to Bama, you just prove to almost everybody in college football that you can't pass the torch and run with it. But look, we all have our – look, nobody automatically thought that Nick Saban was the GOAT after two or three or four years. Yeah, he. I mean, look, Kirby Smart has done more with the Georgia Bulldogs than what Nick Saban did during his first four years there, since the decade began. If you look at Kirby Smart's resume, you have two national championships – you have a New Year's Six Bowl win. I think two, actually. I think they won it in 2020 as well as 2020 this past year against Florida State. Look, you've been to New Year's Six Bowl games on a consistent basis. You're consistently on top of college football. Look, you had to rep- – it's hard to do that on a consistent basis, and you're going to have your struggles. Nick Saban had it in 2019 – as well as 2011 or as 2010, whenever they finished, I think 10 and three. But look, don't be or don't worry about what Kirby Smart does. This is an overreaction. I don't really know if this is the biggest game of his career to solidify his goat status or as the next man up that rule college to rule college football. I think that comes whenever they play Texas. That right there will prove. We'll see. Who is really one of the best and young, brightest young coaches in college football? Is it Steve Sarkeesian or is it Kirby Smart? What did I miss on our overreaction list? Let me know what your guys' thoughts is in the comments down below. Guys, thank you all once again for viewing this video. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Turn on the bell notifications so that you are notified for every time we post a new video. Make sure you follow the socials, Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok at SEC Unfiltered. Until next time, I'm Lucas Hill saying we'll see you later.